Many years ago, I was working at a restaurant as a waiter, and we actually had a large snowstorm, so at that time nobody was coming into the restaurant. And we were all trying to find something to do, and while we were doing that, I was cleaning up, and a group of my fellow co-workers were standing by the front door, and they were having a discussion. Uh, I was listening in a little bit as I was cleaning up, and I began to hear a series of statements about religious people in general. They were saying things like religious people are sheep, are unintelligent, um, that they don't investigate for themselves, that they are belligerent in their presentation of their views, and there was a whole host of things that were being said about religious people in general. At one point, I walked up and I said, you know, forgive me for interrupting, and I spoke to the, if you will, the main speaker at the time. His name was James, and I said, um, James, have you ever studied Buddhism? And he said, no. I said, so you've never, for example, read either Theravadan or Mahayana Buddhist scripture? He said, no. I asked if he'd ever studied Buddhist history. The answer was no. I then turned to another one of my co-workers and I asked, and I said, have you ever examined the history of the life of the Prophet Muhammad or the subsequent era of Islamic civilization? The answer was no. I asked if this individual had ever read the Quran. The answer was no. I then proceeded to ask if they had ever investigated or explored the scriptures, history, and philosophy behind Hinduism, or Judaism, or Christianity, or Shintoism, or Taoism, or Confucianism. And in each case, I actually got an explicit no. We've never really looked at these. So what I did was I said, can you please tell me when you're speaking about how all religious people do X or believe X or act in such a way, what then you could possibly mean if you have never truly taken the time to try to investigate these belief systems, see how people think within them, what they actually say, and explore the foundations of these great traditions of the world's religions. Today we're going to be examining, if you will, the examination of religion. And while there is an ethics of belief, that is, ensuring that one actually has evidence for what they believe, there is also a duty of inquiry as well as a duty of public discourse. We're going to explore some concepts and some simple anecdotes to illustrate those concepts, and then we're going to dive into some deeper topics thereafter. We live in a world where we are given the freedom to use our time in whatever way we see fit. And I think it's important to try to really prioritize investigation before opinion. In this case, I myself, how my own study of comparative religion began, I was living in a small town in British Columbia in Canada, and I used to go to a coffee bar. And I would sit in this local coffee bar, and oftentimes I got into conversations with individuals who were of a Protestant, religious, Christian background. I would end up in having little debates with these individuals, and I would put forward, at that time, my arguments against Christianity. Um, I myself was a secularist. And we'd get into these debates, and I would walk out feeling as if I had won. And in most cases, in the debate, I actually had. Yet one day, after months and months and months of doing this, I walked out, and I was standing out looking over the river, and a thought came to me. And that thought was, that in this small town of about around 10,000 people, there were numerous churches of both Catholic and Protestant persuasion. And the important thing here was that I actually knew the pastors and priests that served these congregations. I could have any time have taken my arguments and questions and thoughts and gone and seen, for example, Father Maglio, or gone across to a United Church, I could have gone to a Presbyterian church, and I could have asked any of these questions to individuals whose job it was to study these traditions. I hadn't. I had actually chosen to, if you will, confine my discussion and my dialogue regarding the Christian tradition to my friends, and as well to individuals who, if I had thought about it for a moment, wouldn't have actually had a great deal of research or investigation themselves. But I was considering this as having defeated, if you will, the Christian tradition. 
Uh, this was a really, really intense moment for me because I realized I had very strong opinions with very little inquiry. I think in addition to this topic, when it comes to approaching, if you will, the priest or the pastor, that it's important to realize that we should seek out, as best we can, those individuals who may be able to respond to our questions at the level of the questions that have been developed. So, if I know someone who actually has investigated and has actually studied these traditions, it would be best that I approach them. Rather than talking, say for example, purely to my atheist friend or my secular friend. This goes for every tradition. If I myself have concerns, say, about Islam, and I am a Christian, does it do to only actually approach my pastor or my priest in order to find out their perspective? Well, it's an important step. At the same time, it might be really important to actually do my own research. This is one of the first principles and teachings of Baha'u'llah, which is the independent investigation of truth. Where I myself say, okay, this individual who I respect and I care for has offered me this presentation and this perspective on the religion. Well, is that true? Can I actually now go and explore it? This relates very intensely to the Baha'i faith and actually how Baha'is actually see religion. Because the fundamental teaching of the Baha'i faith is progressive revelation. That God has communicated to humankind throughout history at different times with different teachings and remedies for the problems that were facing that society. So I myself cannot defend Islam as a viable vehicle for the body politic or the epistemic capacity of humankind in this day. It was actually revealed in a specific evolutionary context to address issues and needs at the level of the people in that age. So in my own perspective, when I encountered the Baha'is, I found out that they were not defending, for example, Christianity as either the social or epistemic perspective for this day, but rather were placing within its evolutionary context and then answering questions regarding it from that perspective. Another issue that arises here along the duty of inquiry is that not only are there priests and pastors or monks or mullahs or imams from the other side, or rabbis for that matter, but there is actually an academic study of religion. And it's important to recognize this. We all know that there are universities and that individuals who study these traditions at a very, very high level. Linguistically, philosophically, historically, and sociologically. So if we wish to try to understand a perspective, for example, on Darwinian theory or on physics, we would do our best if we were to approach those individuals that had done their best to try to understand them and at least consider their positions. This actually goes as well for any individual who might be watching who is a theist, whether Christian or Baha'i or Muslim. Because it's important to actually seek out the best representation of a secular position or an atheist position. I myself continue to and have many times read and reread texts from the atheist tradition. This is a vital step because oftentimes what we end up doing is creating caricatures of another person's position, even at times unconsciously. And if we believe there are no intelligent representations, for example, of Judaism or Christianity or Buddhism or the Baha'i Faith, it's important to recognize that that itself is a claim. And that's, that claim itself can be tested. If I think there are no intelligent representations, for example, for arguments for the existence of God or for an explanation of the Trinity, it is actually a claim that can be tested. I can seek out to see if there are intelligent representations and either confirm my position or falsify it and in, in that case actually raise the intellectual bar of my own life. This is also very, very important when we begin to present someone else's position within a religious or non-religious, be it secular, agnostic, or atheist worldview. It's important to do so because when I actually present to somebody a position, say, from an atheist camp or from a Christian camp, and I present something that is a mere caricature, a watered-down version or a straw man of that position, 
I have not won, I have not defeated that position, what I've actually done is misinformed the other individual and lowered the collective social intellectual bar. I have diminished the level of discourse. I think we're all guilty of this, but it is important that we do our best to try to reach out, try to understand a position as best we can, present it, and then see if it is true, even by attacking or trying to bring it down, if you will. I think this issue of the duty of inquiry is really, really important, because oftentimes many of us hold positions that could be debunked or defeated only because of the level at which we ourselves have investigated it. As well, it's very, very important to try to prioritize our investigative structure. So oftentimes I've had people say, well, I don't actually have time to investigate, say, Buddhism or Hinduism or Christianity or Islam. At the same time, these are extremely powerful ideologies which undergird culture at sometimes for thousands of years. And they inform how individuals act out their lives and actually inform, very often, politics itself and the movements of whole cultures. So when I look at well, sorry, when I look, when I looked at religion in my late teens and in my early 20s, I recognized that these were profoundly powerful forces, and that I needed to try at least to bridge the gap between myself and other cultures, but also understand things, seek out a deeper understanding, if you will, because they affected so many human lives. The same thing goes, for example, for science itself, to try to understand what are the epistemic underpinnings of science, what is the history of science, and what are the social effects of scientific policy, because they affect so many. Once again, with political systems, if I truly wish to, if you will, prioritize my investigative schemes, <laughs> I would want to look at those things which undergird the political structures that currently are in power. This, in my case, directs me wholeheartedly towards political philosophy and comparative political systems. Now, once we actually recognize that we should do our best presentation of a position in order to not lower the intellectual bar of our culture, this immediately excludes, of course, making caricatures or straw men but also of mockery and ridicule. At times we've come, it seems in this time, we've come at, to a place where we're openly willing to actually make fun of another person's perspective or to use derogatory terms for someone else who has a different belief. This does nothing often but entrench those who have an opposing view and also belittles a person <laughs> who actually holds it but also, once again, lowers the intellectual bar. We cannot have our perspectives, both religious, philosophical, based on simple quips and sound bites, because this does great disservice to other individuals, other intellectuals. So rather, we should do our best to represent at the highest capacity someone else's position. It is critical in this spirit of giving the best presentation of someone's perspective of their own or another faith, to recognize that treating all texts literally is not treating them seriously. And it's important to recognize that in universities all around the world, individuals study the use of metaphor, analogy, and symbolism within myth, which means religions we no longer follow, and in current traditions, such as Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, and Hinduism, etc. That it is important to recognize, as an example I often use, that when Plato gives his parable of the cave, this is that parable where individuals are chained to a rock and are facing a rock wall inside of a cave, and there is a fire behind them, and there are clay figures being actually, if you will, moved over top of a wall, and the shadows are cast upon the back of the cave. These individuals in the cave only see the shadows of reality. But when one gets free and turns around and sees the Armeser mere clay figures, 
and goes out into the world and sees what are supposed to be the forms, the true forms of things. A real tree as opposed to a clay tree. A real horse as opposed to a clay horse. When he presents this parable or this analogy, he is not attempting to say that we are actually literally chained inside of a cave. He is attempting to communicate, if you will, symbolic and philosophical notions through these motifs, through these parables, and through these symbols. This form of actual reading scripture has existed for thousands and thousands of years. We have the Greeks do it, the Jewish people doing it, the Christians, the Muslims, the Buddhists, and the Hindus. That when they, we can actually see this. Once again, it is a claim whether or not everybody is always taking them literally. It is, we see actually in the traditions themselves that these individuals are trying to understand what the meaning of these stories are, as opposed to simply taking them as, if you will, neutral, literal, historical fact. So once again, if I'm trying to understand some passage in the Qur'an, I should seek to somebody who is attempting to give a philosophical interpretation of it. If I choose to not investigate that, claiming, for example, that any tradition should be taken at face value as a literal historical claim, that itself is a claim. That itself can be tested to see whether or not that is how that tradition has been understood, whether or not there is a genuine, rational, philosophical treatment of Plato's cave, or passages we might find in the Qur'an, the Buddhist scripture, or the Hindu scripture. So while we have an ethics of belief, there is also a duty of inquiry. Inside that duty of inquiry, we actually, I believe, have a duty to present, as best we can, the belief systems of the other of someone who we do not disagree with. This especially becomes very, very important when we move into the realm of public discourse. We have to make sure that we're representing a tradition, and if we have not, do not have an investigation of that tradition, we may be misrepresenting it and ourselves causing negative, if you will, consequences inadvertently. One night I was invited to a dinner with a group of individuals. And these were all individuals who were in master's programs at a local university here in Vancouver. A conversation began around philosophy and religion and the purpose and meaning of life. One of the individuals present was an atheist, one was a secularist, I myself was a Baha'i, there was another Baha'i in the room, a Christian in a room, and a Muslim. One individual began speaking about Islam and stated that actually true Islam at its heart was what we see in the case of the Taliban. That all throughout human history, they have done nothing but persecute, oppress, and were violent, and actually marginalized groups and killed them. When I heard this, I said to the individual, I said, you know, it's important because if that's true, that is actually a very important truth. And he said it is, because actually what's going on here is you have individuals who believe this, but are not uh, speaking forward, if, if you will, and being honest about their true goals in the path of Islam, which would be to establish a Taliban-like state, an ISIS-like state. And I said again, this is a vital, vital piece of information, if it's true. And it's important to recognize before we actually go into this, that this is a testable claim. We can look at the history of Islam. We have a great deal of information surrounding the Islamic civilization and Arab civilization in general. We can actually look at Islamic civilizations in North Africa. We can look at Islamic Spain. We can look at their relationship, for example, between the Umayyads and the Byzantine Empire, or the Umayyads and the Persian Empire. We can see how the Abbasids ruled. We can actually look at Mughal India. So we actually have a great wealth of information as to how the Islamic world related to other people people of other faiths. In addition, we have a great deal of historical information about the life of the Prophet Muhammad, and in the case of Shiism, we have actually pronouncements from the Imams of the Shia faith on how to relate to and connect with people of diverse worldviews. And I said, so if what you're saying is genuinely true, 
it is vitally important because I should be deeply afraid of my neighbor. Because my neighbor is a Muslim, and if what you're saying is true, he is hiding the truth of what he is attempting to do, coming under false pretenses, and trying to institute a very, very negative worldview upon the culture in which I live. So I'm hoping, I said to the individual, that you have done your due diligence to investigate how Islamic rulings have been, what these traditions are, and what the history is before you chose to say such a thing in this room, because this individual beside me, Omar, would then, if you will, be a clandestine individual who's hiding his true intentions. This is very important, and this again goes for the treatment of any world system. Any worldview, sorry. If I myself am going to speak out about what atheists are, I have to make sure that I've tried my best to understand that tradition. If I'm going to do this about the Jewish religion, or any belief system whatsoever, it's important that I, especially before moving into the domain of public discourse, I actually fulfill my duty of inquiry before I speak. This is why, and I've spoken on this just momentarily before, why it's so important to avoid ridicule and mocking of different people's belief systems. Because not only do I lower the intellectual bar, for ridicule does nothing but entrench and push people away, but it can actually take someone and push them to an extreme version of that position because they believe that is their only way out. This is coming to the fore, if you will, in our current intellectual and social climate, where you actually have individuals being pushed apart to extreme poles of different social issues, where those in the middle who are trying to understand it in a more nuanced way are either not being heard or being forced, if you will, by the poles to choose sides, or are seen as betraying one of these different sides. It is very common because we are getting increasingly used to, if you will, sound bites, little quips, and memes that push us in different ways. The best remedy for such a thing is the independent investigation of truth, the recognition of that duty of inquiry, and the patient investigation of these things before we speak out publicly. Thank you.